Hi, my name is Linda Oltman and I am the Education Coordinator for the Pergamon Watershed Conservancy. And today we are going to be learning more about some of the macroinvertebrates that are commonly found in the East Branch of the Pergamon Creek. So before we go too far with our presentation here, let's uh, define what a macroinvertebrate is. So this uh, large word, if you break it apart and look at the first part of the word, that macro portion means that these are organisms that you can see without the aid of a microscope. So you can see them with your naked eye. The middle part of that word is a prefix in, and in means no or not. And that brings us to the last part of the word, which is vertebrate. So vertebrate organisms are those that have an internal backbone or skeleton. So when we talk about macroinvertebrates, we are looking at organisms that we can see with our eyes, but don't have any sort of internal skeleton of bone or cartilage. So stream macroinvertebrates include um, both adult insects and uh, the immature larva and nymph stages of insects, and also a variety of other organisms, including mussels, snails, crustaceans, and different types of worms. So now that we've defined what a macroinvertebrate is, we're going to talk about why we want to study them. So first of all, macroinvertebrates are very easy to collect. They're typically very numerous in uh, bodies of water, and they're also really interesting to learn about. They have a lot of um, interesting adaptations, and their life cycles are interesting, so they are definitely fun to learn about. Um, but more importantly, the reason we study them is because we can learn something about the water quality by studying what types of macroinvertebrates we find in a body of water. These macroinvertebrates have been studied extensively and we know a lot about how sensitive they are to different types of pollution and modifications in their habitat. So based on what you find, you can determine how clean that body of water is. So macroinvertebrates are typically divided into groups or taxa based on their sensitivity to pollution. Group one being the most sensitive organisms, group two is kind of middle of the road, and group three are those organisms that are fairly tolerant to pollution. But of course, you know, a body of water could become so polluted that not even group three organisms could survive. So when you look at a macroinvertebrate population in a body of water, what you want to see is um, a large number of organisms, a good amount of diversity, so lots of different types of organisms, and you definitely want to see some organisms from group one, those that are known to be sensitive to pollution. We're going to begin by looking at some of the group one or pollution sensitive macroinvertebrates that we commonly find in the east branch of the creek. Um, like I said before, their presence combined with good biodiversity is a good indicator of um, good water quality. This group includes mayfly nymphs, stonefly nymphs, water pennies, helgramets, riffle beetles, gild snails, and caddisfly larvae. The first organism that we're going to take a look at here is the nymph of a common stonefly. And this nymph is found in the East Branch Creek. We don't find them in large numbers, but we do find them on occasion. And this nymph is known to be very sensitive to pollution. So finding them is always a good sign for the East Branch Creek. Now let's look at some of the adaptations. This um, nymph has kind of a flattened body. It has two claws on the end of each of its legs that help it to hold on to the, the rocky bottom stream. Stoneflies always have two tail filaments. Um, we're going to look at another organism in a little bit that has more than two. 
And the stonefly in this video is doing what looks like push-ups. So when the oxygen content drops too low for the organism, it kind of does something that looks like he's doing push-ups to increase the water flow over its gills, which are located at the base of its legs, to increase the water flow and get more oxygen. So really cool organism. Here we have a picture of the common stonefly in the nymph form. And then on the right, we have a picture of the adult flying insect that it transforms into. Uh, now this, um, this life cycle is what we call incomplete metamorphosis. So it goes from egg to nymph to adult. There is no pupa stage in this particular life cycle. So the nymph will just shed its exoskeleton many times as it grows and develops. And then when it's ready to become an adult, it will basically just break out of its exoskeleton and emerge as an adult flying insect. The next organism we're going to look at is the larva of a beetle that lives on the land, and this is called a water penny. Now we find lots of water pennies in the east branch of the Perkiomen Creek. And these are known to be pretty sensitive to pollution, so that is definitely a good sign for the East Branch. Now, the larva is perfectly adapted to living in a flowing water environment. It has a very flattened uh, body shape. It has thin, flexible plates that allow it to conform to the shape of the rock. And it has a dense fringe of hair along the outside of those plates, which increase the, the grip even more on the rock. Um, the organism uh, feeds by scraping uh, whatever is growing on the rock, so that layer of algae and diatoms and bacteria is the perfect meal for this guy, so he just spends his life scraping that stuff off the rock. And uh, on the underside, you can see that the organism has uh, feathery gills. That, that's how it obtains its oxygen. Now when this guy is ready to become an adult, he will leave the water and go through a pupa stage in the soil and then emerge as an adult beetle. So here we have a, a look at what the water penny looks like at various points in its life cycle. On the left we have the water penny larva on a rock in the stream. And then the two pictures in the middle and on the right show the adult. On the far right, we have um, the picture of the female water penny beetle returning to the water to lay her eggs on a rock. So if you see some bright yellow eggs deposited on, the, on a rock in the stream, you might just be looking at the eggs of a water penny beetle. What we're looking at now is the nymph of a flat-headed mayfly. And uh, this particular type of mayfly is found in large numbers in the east branch of the Perkiomen Creek. There are uh, lots of other families of mayflies, um, some of which we do find routinely in the east branch as well, but this one is very numerous. Uh, the flat-headed mayfly is really well adapted for living in a flowing water environment. It has a very flattened body. It has hooks on its feet. Uh, most of these mayflies feed by scraping and grazing on the material on the rocks. Uh, some of them are also feed by collecting um, food particles. They have gills on their abdomen, which they are able to flutter to increase the water flow over their gills to get more oxygen out of the water. Now, when this organism is ready to become an adult, it will uh, molt a final time and emerge as what's called a subadult. Um, at this point, it is not fully mature, so it has to go through one more molt and then it becomes an adult flying insect. Uh, adults are very short lived. Uh, they do not even have mouth parts to feed because they will not uh, live more than a couple days. So, their job as an adult is just to mate and lay eggs, and that is the end of their life cycle. 
In this slide we are looking at a nymph of a flat-headed mayfly and on the right we have a picture of what the adult flying insect looks like. So uh, the nymph almost always has those three tail filaments. There are a very few type of mayflies that have two tails but almost all have three and the adult on the right you can see just has the two tail filaments and again these are really short-lived as adults. We are now looking at the larva of a Dobson fly. The larva of the Dobson fly is also called a Helgramet. We do find these pretty often in the east branch of the creek. And this uh, larva can get quite large, uh, easily, you know, about three inches um, at the mature size. So they are pretty large when they're mature. The larva has, um, of course, six legs, like every insect, and it also has a bunch of filaments sticking out of its abdomen. And at the base of each of those filaments is a feathery gill tuft. And each of those gill tufts have a muscle attached so that they can, you know, move those gill tufts in and out to help increase the oxygen flow over the gills. So you can see that in the close-up of the video of him moving his gills in and out. Uh, the Dobson fly larva are predators. They will eat other macroinvertebrates. You can see it's got a, a good set of jaws on it. And, you know, if you try to pick up a large one, you might get pinched by it. When this organism is ready to become an adult, it will leave the water to go through a pupa stage and then it will emerge as the adult Dobson fly. So we have a picture here of the larva of the Dobson fly or the Helgramet on the left and we have a picture of the adult uh, Dobson flies on the right. So we have the female at the top and the male at the bottom. So the male has those very long scary looking uh, jaws um, it is believed that those are used to kind of attract the female, to, you know, impress the female, possibly joust with other males. Um, the female actually is capable of delivering a painful bite, so she's really the one you have to watch out for. We are now looking at an adult riffle beetle. So this, um, this is the adult uh, phase of this organism. Its uh, larvae also live in the water. It's kind of a, a worm-like looking uh, critter. The riffle beetle, true to its name, likes to live in the faster moving portions of the water. So the riffle zones, the areas where it's moving quickly over rock and it's well oxygen oxygenated is where you will typically find the adult riffle beetles. Um, they have very long, sharp claws on their legs that allow them to hang on to the rocks and not get swept away. Uh, they tend to be very slow movers, so you can, uh, when you look at them up close, you can see that they crawl slowly over the rocks. Now these guys have an interesting way of getting oxygen. They have a sh very short, dense layer of waterproof hairs covering their body, and they're able to trap a layer of air around their body, and that's how they get their oxygen, um, is through that layer of air. It's kind of diffused across their, um, their whole body through that layer of air. Um, when the adults first emerge they have a very brief period where they have wings and they fly and then they return to the water for the rest of their life and they lose their ability to fly once they return to the water. So in this slide we have a picture of the larva of a riffle beetle and on the right we have a close-up picture of the adult. So the larva looks a little bit like a, you know, a caterpillar type larva. It will go through a pupa stage and then emerge as the adult beetle. We are now looking at a larva of a net spinner caddisfly. There are lots of different types of caddisflies. We do find a, a number of different ones living in the East Branch Creek. 
The net spinners are probably one of the most numerous that we find. Um, and that's what we're looking at in our video here. Now, this is uh, one of the types of caddisflies that make an attached retreat. So, caddisfly larvae are able to spin a silk-like material, and they use that silk to weave together small pebbles, uh, maybe other types of plant material, and they make a house that they attach to a rock. Um, other types of caddisflies uh, make cases that they actually live inside and walk around in their cases. And there are a few types of caddisflies that are just free living. They do not um, live in any sort of case or retreat. Uh, the net spinner has uh, nice tufts of gills all lining its abdomen so it gets its oxygen through those gills. Uh, when this organism is um, trying to catch food, it constructs a mesh net that it exposes to the current uh, near the entrance to its retreat. And then it comes out and it just feeds on whatever it has captured in its mesh net. So, very interesting way of feeding. Uh, these guys can be very territorial, so they will defend their territory from other caddisfly larvae. When they are ready to pupate, they will basically seal off their retreat and they will go through their pupa stage inside that retreat, making a silk cocoon around themselves inside the retreat. We are now looking at the larva of a net spinner caddisfly on the left and on the right we have a picture of what an adult caddisfly looks like. Next we are going to take a look at some group 2 organisms. So group 2 organisms are those that are moderately sensitive to pollution or disturbances in the habitat. So included in this group are some types of caddisflies. Like I said before, there are many different types and some are more sensitive than others. Uh, we also have sow bugs, scuds, crayfish, clams, damselfly nymphs, and crane fly larvae included in group two. So if you find group two organisms and also find group one organisms, that's a good sign for your creek. But if you only find group two and three organisms, it could mean that there has been some disturbance to your creek and uh, there could be some pollution in the water. The first group two organism that we're looking at here is a damselfly nymph. Uh, this particular one is what's called a narrow-winged damselfly. There are different types of damselflies. These guys are very closely related to dragonflies, so very uh, like cousins. Uh, the larva has uh, three paddle or leaf-shaped tails. These are actually the organism's gills, so it, it does obtain oxygen through those tails. Um, it is a predator. This organism has a really interesting way of feeding. It has a very long lower lip that is elbowed. Um, when it's not feeding, it keeps it folded back uh, on the underside of the head. And then when it sees something it wants to eat, it is able to shoot out that lower lip very quickly and snag whatever it is trying to get. The lower lip actually is tooth, so it has um, a couple of sharp uh, teeth on there that it can grab whatever it's after. So it is a really effective uh, way of catching food. Uh, you can normally see on these organisms the beginning of wings growing. They have wing pads on their thorax. They have two claws on the end of each leg to help them hold on. Uh, this is a nymph, so it will not go through a pupa stage. It will simply uh, shed its exoskeleton a number of times as it grows and develops, and then eventually it will just emerge as the adult flying damselfly. So now we're looking at a picture of the damselfly nymph 
on the left and a picture of an adult damselfly on the right. Um, I mentioned that the nymph is a predator. The adults are also um, very effective predators. We are now looking at what's called an Asian clam. Uh, this clam is actually a mussel, and it is not a native species. It originated um, in Asia and was introduced to the United States somewhere around uh, 1930 or so. And now it's found, you know, across the continental United States. Um, this organism is what we call a filter feeder. And you can see in the video that there are two uh, structures, they're called siphons. They look almost like little straws that the organism um, puts out into the water. And one of the siphons is drawing water into the clam. And inside the clam's body, it filters out very small particles of food and then the uh, water is uh, ejected out through the other siphon. So it is, um, you know, that's the way that it feeds is by just simply filtering whatever is in the water. This organism also has a uh, foot. It's like a jelly-like uh, blob there coming out the other side of the organism. And it can use its foot to help it burrow down into the gravel so that it doesn't get swept away. And it also can use its foot to feed a little bit too on things that may be in the sediment. Um, immature clams are just basically very small versions of the... We are now looking at what's called an aquatic sow bug. These guys are also called isopods. And uh, they have seven pairs of legs, so lots of legs. They have uh, claws on the end of each of their legs. Um, on the first pair of legs, the claws are actually hinged, so they can use them to grasp. Um, they have two forked tails at the end of their body. This organism um, has an interesting life cycle. The female actually has a pouch um, on her abdomen where she will hold her eggs and the young after they hatch will actually stay in that pouch for a period of time before they are uh, off on their own. This organism breathes via gills that it has at the base of its leg. So again this is the aquatic soap bug. The last group two organism that we're going to look at in this presentation is called a scud or a side swimmer. It gets that uh, name of a side swimmer because of the way that it swims around on its side. Uh, like the, the sow bug, this guy is also an omnivore, so it will eat plant and animal material. It also has seven pairs of clawed walking legs and a hinged claw on the first set of legs, just like the isopod did. This organism also has swimming appendages on the rear half of its body, and they can swim very quickly. They tend to avoid bright light, so they are more active at nighttime. And they have gills. They're like flat oval sacs that are at the base of each of their legs. And just like the, the sow bugs or the isopods, the females have a pouch and carry their eggs and their young around in the pouch. So the last uh, group of organisms that we're going to look at today are group three organisms. And these are organisms that are generally known to be pretty tolerant of pollution in the water. So if you were in a body of water and you were only finding group three organisms such as leeches and aquatic worms and black fly larva, midge fly larva, lung snails, and you're not finding any representatives from group one or two, then that body of water is probably not very healthy. So you might want to think about getting your feet out of that water. <laughs> so you do not want to find a body of water that only has group three organisms. The last organism in our presentation today is the leech. 
The leech is a group three organism known to be tolerant to pollution. So if you're in a body of water and you're finding lots of leeches and not much else, it is probably not a good sign for that body of water. Um, leeches are segmented worms. They have suction cups on both ends. Uh, the mouth is within the front suction cup. Um, leeches can be very uh, colorful. They can have uh, lots of patterns on them. The one in our video is like a polka dot looking leech. Um, some of them are parasitic, um, but others do feed on just other smaller prey. And they obtain their oxygen by just diffusion through their skin. They're very long and thin, and they're able to get all the oxygen they need just uh, by getting that oxygen through their skin. So thank you for watching this presentation today where we featured some of the commonly found macroinvertebrates in, from the East Branch Creek. Um, this of course is not everything that we find in the East Branch. We also commonly find uh, crayfish and cranefly larva, larva and flatworms and other types of organisms. But today we just featured some of the more commonly found ones. Um, I would encourage you to visit our website at perkiumlandwatershed.org to learn more about the mission of the Conservancy and some of the other programs that we offer. So thanks for watching. Bye-bye.